And Dr. Chu went a step further and took a look at um, uh, age and gender differences and uh, what he uncovered through his 91 subject sample uh, of subjects ranging in age from 20 to 80, 40 years of age, uh, that there was no significant difference in the strength uh, among the groups as they aged. However, there was a significant difference in isometric strength between the males and females. Uh, with that, uh, males tend to be on average 1.2 to 1.7 times stronger than the female population. That study was published uh, in clinical rehabilitation. What we're going to do now is take a, a, a brief look through a, just a video demo, just to give you a, some, some background as to uh, how the system collects the data um, and how we use it. So it's important to note that the system moves in all three planes of motion. Uh, so we're going to collect data in the, the sagittal, frontal, and transverse plane. So whether it be looking at um, our forward flexion and extension, our lateral flexion, um, or rotation of the system, uh, we're going to capture range of motion in all three different all three different planes. It's also important to note that there are no motors that are driving this unit. This is only powered by the strength of the subject. So uh, in, in terms of if there's any concern or anxiety about some motor that's, that's moving somebody's head, uh, I can assure you there's no motors in this. So here we're looking at uh, a range of motion now in the uh, lateral plane, uh, uh, lateral rotation, here we have lateral flexion. And throughout this, uh, we're capturing data looking at both the, uh, the velocity of movement as well as the, the range of motion in time. Um, the software is calculating the averages, the peaks, it's taking the coefficients of variation so we can look at consistencies uh, for the client and uh, here we've got a video of, of entering the client information or client data into the system, so creating them so that we can save the data and report on their progress. Uh, whether it's pulling off the anatomy and, and, and selecting, a, uh, creating a problem list uh, that we're going to address, or it's using a protocol uh, that's preloaded, such as the Melbourne Protocol, is a great way to help a clinician get started uh, as soon as that system hits the door. Within the protocol, we've got our, our self-reports, which are our symptom intensity rating and neck disability index. There's a, additional reports, such as the Dallas Pain Questionnaire. Um, once we've created our, our, our testing data and we've collected their isometric strength values, uh, we're then going to take and create an exercise program using the weight stack uh, that is a medical grade weight stack where we're uh, using uh, half pound, one pound, or two pound weights in order to uh, strengthen the cervical spine. To generate a report, we select the data that we've collected, we select to whom we want to send that report, and we can generate reports of progress, um, of comprehensive assessment. Those reports can range as simple as one page or up to, to 12 to 13 pages depending on the content and the amount of data that's been collected. Now, I touched earlier on the radar graph. In 2007, we introduced the radar graph uh, that was developed here with our, our engineers uh, and looking at a, a unique uh, way to simplify uh, the 16 different isometric strength measures that we collect with the subject. So on the screen, we see a red and a green line. Uh, that represents a one standard of deviation away from the mean. So looking at both the low and the high targets uh, for what we would like to see as ideal strength. Here we see a strength pattern from a, a female who was involved in a motor vehicle accident 11 years prior. Uh, we can see that she was, uh, she was impacted from the side. Uh, her head was slightly rotated to the right at the point of impact. And here we see that the majority of the damage or injury that occurred uh, is here to this uh, left lateral border uh, of the, the neck. Uh, whereas the, the area that sustained the least amount of injury is over here on the right. Here we've got a, a, an umpire uh, with some, again, some very noticeable asymmetries and also a history of chronic neck pain. A lot of that being due to the, uh, the, 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 the deflected balls hitting the face mask. Additional, um, additional uh, sample reports, a female, uh, this is a, a European uh, elite uh, auto race or race car driver. 
Uh, and so here we pull this one in, taking a look at uh, just the, the significant amount of strength compared to the, uh, the reference population that an elite male rugby player uh, displays. Uh, so uh, if there's any question or doubt about the ability of the unit to stand up to very high loads, high forces, um, we've had some of the, the strongest necks within the NFL, uh, the Rugby Football Union, as well as uh, now working with, uh, with hockey in Canada. As we look at the, uh, the next step in this process is kind of understanding uh, the, 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 some of the terminology that we're going to use referring to the movement patterns and the muscle groups. Uh, so we refer to the cervical spine in sort of two different levels. Uh, we've got what we call the typical cervical, uh, which is going to be uh, the lower cervical spine and then craniocervical. Craniocervical is where we get the majority of our range of motion and flexion. So the majority of our motion actually comes from the upper cervical spine. Uh, and that's also where the greatest amount of concern comes from the stability side of things. So as we look at the, the patterning within the, the radar graph assessment, uh, as we see that the strength patterns of the neck tend to be the highest or the greatest in the posterior aspect of the spine, we can see that that is matched up here uh, simply by the sheer amount of muscle mass that is occurring posteriorly. Uh, so all of our deep to superficial uh, cervical extensors uh, create a tremendous amount of strength. And if we don't have good balance here, where is it, anteriorly, with our uh, rectus capitis, rectus coli, or I'm sorry, longus capitis, longus coli, um, having those, those deep uh, cervical muscles, uh, deep flexor muscles that lie just anterior to the uh, vertebral body of the, the cervical spine, if we don't have good activation and stability of those, it makes it very difficult for us to carry out our testing and training programs on the unit. So even though while we look at a measurement of the cervicothoracic flexion or cervicothoracic extension, we're still incorporating elements of that craniocervical flexion and craniocervical extension uh, because they are required then for proper stabilization uh, to allow for, for movement. Good. So here we see with the craniocervical flexion that our axis of rotation is going to occur about the external auditory meatus, uh, whereas with the typical cervical or what we would call cervicothoracic flexion, is going to occur uh, lower at C6, C7. The, the same is true for extension. Uh, here we look at craniocervical extension. Uh, axis of rotation is going to be about the uh, external auditory meatus and again lower at C6, C7. Key things here is this is how we incorporate into our isometric testing. So for example, if I'm going to test forward flexion in an isometric fashion where I'm pushing into the pads. When I stabilize uh, the forehead and push forward, if I don't have good stabilization of the upper cervical spine as I push forward, the chin is going to jut forward and I'll slide out underneath the pads. That's a dead giveaway that the subject does not know how to activate and stabilize those deep flexors. When we see an, an isometric test or, or a range of motion test, when they're flexing into that pattern, I should see this, the chin tuck and then generate their force. So that's one of the key elements of understanding the balance between the cervicothoracic and craniocervical movement patterns.